Well, hello and welcome. We are so delighted that you are joining with us today. In this podcast, we are just making space for healthy and engaging conversations to happen on different topics. And education, specifically looking at some of the pressures of it, but also the well-being side of it, has been highlighted by young people as something that they'd really like to hear people talk about. So today we are just making the space for that to happen. So we've got some incredible people who are involved in education, whether that means that they're in the system, whether they've just left it or working within it, here to just open up a conversation on education and all that it is. So we are now just going to start by introducing ourselves. So I'll go first. My name is Emma. I am a second year um, student at university and I'm studying social policy and I'll just kind of be hosting, facilitating, asking questions within this conversation. Jamie. Hello, my name is Jamie Adoki. I am a past uni student. So I went to university in Portsmouth and I actually graduated six months ago. So I am a fairly recent university student, currently on a gap year, um, and I'm excited to be part of this podcast to spread insight as I've recently been part of the education system. So excited to be part of this podcast today and um, yeah, looking forward to our conversation. Amazing. Ikem. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ikem and I am a special educational needs assessment and placement officer um, in a local authority. Um, I have also worked in education as a mathematics teacher in, at secondary school level. Um, I'm a graduate of Nottingham Trent University, so I've been to uni as well. And yeah, that's me. I'm looking forward to talking about well-being and just kind of breaking down that topic. I think it's so central and for all of us so I think it's going to be good to talk about it shed some light on it and hopefully learn I guess from each other's experiences. Lovely Hannah. Hi I'm Hannah I um, have done a year of university I was at King's College um, and I've taken a year out done it like deferred a year so I've not had a very straightforward path so hopefully that's kind of brings a different insight because it's very easy to be like oh that's the way to do it and if I don't do it that way I'm wrong so yeah hopefully it'll just bring a different perspective amazing and Rebecca I'm Rebecca and I'm a secondary school teacher head of year for year eight and um, so I've got 360 kids that I'm in charge of um, and I've been teaching for around 18 years we think keep on trying to work it out at school but been teaching for um, a long time so I've seen a lot of changes in education um, in that time and if any of you know me you love it no I love a podcast so always happy to be involved. Amazing so I'm just gonna start off with a bit of an intro question um, to get us going in. So how has the COVID pandemic affected wellbeing within education? Do you find there to be a greater stress on wellbeing in education um, because of it? So for me as a teacher, obviously it's been a big, a big shift. So as a head of year, I am responsible for wellbeing. Pastorally, that's my responsibility, but um, I would, so there's always been a big aspect of that um, in terms of allowing students a safe space to receive support within school. Um, however, during the pandemic and post lockdown going back in, we've seen an increase in counselling referrals. Um, we're having to do much more mentoring, um, supporting parents. That's been, I would say, this year, probably my biggest remit is little me telling parents how to cope with teenagers um, and I sometimes feel a bit underqualified for the job but I think people have struggled with routines and um, getting those back is quite hard the increase of social media obviously as well it was always an issue but lockdown made it worse because everyone was on devices and therefore there was a big reliance on that and that has had a massive impact on um, people's mental well-being um, completely yeah so I would say the pandemic has increased my workload in that sense. Um, and yeah, people are struggling. For some, it was really positive. For some, they really, really thrived on it. And, you know, when we asked them when they came back, would you want another lockdown? A lot of them say, yeah, because it was easier for us. The, the stronger ones were able to manage their work. I think about my two, I know for Felito, he really 
didn't like the online learning but liked the independent side of it so it was a big positive for some people I think it taught them skills but on the well-being side I think they missed the social interaction I think I found because we kind of got caught with it at a weird time it was like literally getting ready to set our A-level exams and then it was basically your exams are cancelled and we didn't really know how we were getting into uni or how we were doing anything so I think for me where my well-being was most impacted was like the uncertainty I'm such a planner I'm such like okay well I'm gonna do this 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 and this and to suddenly not have that that I feel was one of the biggest challenges for me um and then doing my first year of uni all online I actually didn't have one lecture or seminar in person I met three people from my course so as someone who absolutely just thrives from being around people I found that really difficult and I found that that made it a lot more difficult to actually engage in my course and like get involved in things in university because I was like well I don't know anyone so I just like really like lacked motivation so I found that was the biggest yeah the uncertainty and the lack of social side of education I found really difficult Mm. I'd have to agree I think much like everyone else um, I found a really big difficulty in not just missing out on the social aspect of things but how the social aspect of things affected learning and teaching personally for me at the time I wasn't actually doing um, the job I'm doing now I was still teaching um, kids who weren't accessing school like mainstream school or one going to secondary school so I teach them in their homes or libraries and I think immediately it kind of sucked the life out of the job and I felt a little bit displaced and I could see how difficult it was for you know kids going to school and trying to learn all of a sudden having to learn online and my kids were already like so challenged already so that created this massive difficulty in just the whole like teaching and learning transaction and that then created a knock-on effect personally for me in my job because I was like, I'm not satisfied like this. I don't feel like I'm helping kids. I don't feel like I'm teaching kids. I feel like I'm trying to get kids to stay on a screen for a certain amount of time because the children I teach, like I said, are some of the most challenged could be behaviorally, could be from an SEMH perspective, any sort of like, uh, sorry, lots of acronyms could be from a social, emotional, mental health perspective um, or from any aspect of which we sort of... um, judge or take account of special educational needs and so it was it was just difficult all around and I think yeah there were some really good strengths there were some kids who found it easier that they like they were they found it like quite streamlined in terms of the fact that they had to come on learn and then go and do work and it cut out all the sort of in between that maybe some of our kids who find it a bit more difficult to learn uh, in groups of people they found it easier to learn, they found it easier to access the help. And so variable experiences, but overall quite difficult for my, me and myself. And that's so much so that it led to me changing jobs. So I don't know how that made anyone else feel in their job, work, school state. I think uh, I wanted to add um, kind of similar to Hannah. I was in my second year when the first lockdown hit. Um, And it was just really interesting um, because I think at uni, I remember actually when it got announced, everyone was celebrating, all my housemates were celebrating, which is really bad. (laughs) Everyone was like, yes, it's so rough. But then uh, then we realised after a week, this is not good. And definitely after a year, we're like, yeah, this is not good. We shouldn't have been celebrating. Um, But it was really crazy because I think, especially for uni students, I think a lot of them went through... um, a lot of emotions maybe you wouldn't normally go through. So whether that was anxiety and and stuff like that, I've definitely known students that have gone through that a lot more. I think um, some people that liked, so when we were in lockdown, liked that isolation and actually when it was opening all back up again, for a lot of them, it was quite hard to socialise with other people. And I already think at university when a lot of people are new and you're trying to break into new friendship groups, I think that added pressure of, um something kind of disrupting that flow of meeting people with already you being Mm. new I think for a lot of people that was quite challenging um 
but yeah I would say for myself in in second year I think for, for me what what made it quite sad was it kind of just sped up my uni process because I missed out mm. probably four months and so that's my second year gone and now straight into third year um and of course I do believe it was all part of God's plan um but yeah for me it wasn't necessarily negative it was just more being sped up and life went a lot more quickly and I think for a lot more students they may be thinking oh I've got four months you know to think of what I'll do at the end of my uni degree that's already taken away from them and they're having to think a bit more quickly what am I going to do after uni um so that was more my perspective of it so far I think yeah I think what um you're all touching on particularly is this disappointment of Oh, I feel like recently God's been saying expect the unexpected and I think even mm. now as we go into this new year I really felt that around Christmas God was saying expect the unexpected because let's be honest no one expected this and I know a lot of the students I teach they came in their GCSE year and these are like <laughs> we're just disappointed because you couldn't prove yourself and I think mm. like you're saying these are things that you are expecting to do and as much as for some the lack of exams was like oh great actually they all didn't expect it but their mock results that were then affecting it and so a lot of people didn't achieve what they probably would have done had they sat the exam I know the higher end students felt like they couldn't the grades probably weren't worth the same because when you've worked for it there's that pride in it and a lot of them said we've prepared so hard for it to be stripped from us and even now Felito's doing his sats this year and I will be gutted if he can't sit those sats and I know he's only in year six but he's someone who takes pride in learning and is striving to be best Mm -hmm. and actually I want that hard work to pay off that he will get to the end of his primary education and say I've got these results to show the hard work I did so I think yeah there's been a lot of things stripped from people like the experience like Jamie said of Hannah going to uni I mean Emma I don't know how you did it I struggled in my first year at uni and I was in a normal situation so to go with no interaction I can see Hannah why it's really hard because for me as an extrovert I would have just given up I'm going to uh, have the same But then it's also that fact of like when you get into uni and you kind of, you know, in the first couple of like weeks, months, you kind of create that insular group that kind of sees you throughout the whole uni process. And I think that was the other thing is just people were expecting so much. And there was a first in so many different ways. There was first if you were in uni. There was a first in school of the centre assessed grades thing. And that worked out for some and didn't for others. And I think... However you experience, particularly this center assess grades thing, it was a roller coaster for everyone. And they're like, for some people, particularly in my house, you know, it, it was like a household uh, psychology that we were all struggling with because my youngest sister was going to get her uh, grades to go to university. And she had expected that she was going to be all right and, you know, get, get her predicted grades were all right. But then she didn't get what her predicted grades were when the teachers, you know, took into account. She missed her, I think it was her maths grade or something. Um, And so then life just shifted forward for her a year. But then, you know, then you had the disappointment of not just her missing out her kind of social environment, being with her friends, having her last day of school as usual, having her prom as usual, all of these things that she kind of missed out on and they just kind of threw together, you know, to try and give the kids some sense of normality. Then, you know, she also doesn't get that outcome. And so it was kind of like this constant, well, we didn't do very well at expecting the unexpected, as you say, as you say Rebecca, did we? Because it, it was so hard for some, some of us, it was, you got over one and then the, at the next turn or the next junction where, you thought, okay, well, maybe this is my chance to maybe assume some sense of normality or kind of get an outcome that makes me think, yeah, okay, we're getting through this. You just had to get used to something new all over again. And it went, I think the interesting thing is it did go past just the kids. It went past to networks of families and siblings and parents. God bless the parents for the whole pandemic. I don't know how people like you, Rebecca, who are teachers, parents, nuts. but um. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that just recalling on that was 
hard to deal with because there were just no words for my sister who was so disappointed. And then she's looking at sitting exams all over again. So her next year becomes, I, I suppose, well, her next month, few months became, you know, intense study. Yeah, okay. I think my, my well, my parents had the same thing. My, I think my parents still joke and say that I was like the worst person to be around the first few weeks because those of you that know me anyway know that I'm quite emotional. <laughs> <laughs> and so you would be suddenly hit with all of this like uncertainty and all of these change of plans I was like in tears just all the time and I also was in a weird position where I hadn't properly decided on my universities when um when we went into lockdown I was supposed to go up to Durham for an open day to decide between my last two unis and that then obviously got cancelled because we went into a lockdown. And then that put me in a weird position where I was like, I either have to take a risk and go, yeah, do you know what? I'll go to Durham where I'm really far from home and I've not visited the uni. Or I need to just be like, OK, well, I know that I like Kings enough, so I'll just go there. And that was a weird situation to navigate um, as well. And we went, I think not that we had it worse than the year after, but I think the year after us kind of went into their, they had different stages of mocks and they went into them being like, okay, these are going to be important. Whereas we kind of went into our mocks like, yeah, they're important because we're in year 13, but Mm. their mocks. um, And I did horrendously in my mocks. I did really badly (laughs) um, because I was really unwell. um, Essentially, Coming back to the pressures of education, I got really unwell during sixth form purely because of stress and just literally just got slammed with migraines. And I had a migraine for four out of five days of my mocks and I didn't do very well at all. And I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> like, and thankfully, I managed to get the grades to get into the uni that I wanted to go to. But I was like so disappointed because I was like this was not a reflection on me at all and um like what Rebecca was saying about it being a chance to prove yourself what I found really helpful was our head teacher turned around and said but you have to remember that you've done your A-levels like your A-levels aren't the exams the A-levels are the two years that you spend learning the content doing mocks doing end of year things all of that so you it's not that you're getting grades that you don't deserve. It's not like you're cheating. Like you've done your A-levels. You've just missed the last bit. And for me, I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, that's true. Because I was like, oh, I don't deserve these grades. We're just being handed them. And on one hand, it was like a weird thing. Because on one hand, it was like, it's actually really unfair for other years. But then on the other hand, we've been put in a really weird position. So yeah, that was just a little, I rambled a bit there, but. I think going a little bit off tenure but just what people are saying it um, makes me think what will be the impact long term though because anybody who spent any time with me gets the when you're 30 the happy birthday now your life goes a bit of a mess talk which um, I always I think I shared with you all recently but when you're in your you know your teens and your 20s and rightly so you think you're invincible, you think you're going to change the world and kind of it's great. And then as you get older, life gets a little bit more interesting and challenging and more, you you know, you have disappointments and then you kind of grow up and then I'm told life begins at 40. But um, I think the like and actually those adventurous things are what you should be doing when you're young. And actually that disappointment has come quite early for a lot of people then it makes me think long term will that damage young people in your position in their 20s and um, who have had disappointment unnaturally at a younger stage than at the the crisis point I mean it, it happens to different people at different points there's no clear-cut theory <laughs> um, but it does make me think you've had that disappointment will you now be more cautious Will young people be more, yeah, not willing to take those risks? Because the last time you did it, look what happened. We don't know what's around the corner again. So I think we won't see the long-term impact until even in 20 years, it may then show out in society. Yeah, I'd agree with you on that, Rebecca. I think 
it's, it's something that's evolving day to day. And even the way I, f- I feel about like the first part of the pandemic versus now is completely different. And by the time we got around to like getting out of the first pandemic and then having a bit of a summer and then coming around mentally, we were different. But I think, you know, when you look at it as a long snapshot, we're, go- we're going to year three of this. It's like, there's there's been a lot to, to go through, a lot that maybe we haven't even had time. And I think that's why this conversation is actually quite good, even though it doesn't, we're not currently in the middle of a big lockdown here. Yeah, we've had a rough Christmas moment um, and we're still pulling through that. But I think it's so important to keep tracking it so that, you know, we don't end up with sort of this like build up, I guess, of what you could call as like, you know, social trauma because there's been so much changing and so much uncertainty and in some ways so much growth so i think also it's nice to wait and see how people continue to grow from this i think you know you can there's a whole conversation to be had about like the workforce and how the youngest generation in the workforce are responding to this and even you know us lot who are older 30s and above um but yeah i think we've got to keep keep talking each other and supporting each other through it because it's just been so crazy yeah well that was a bulky question <laughs> yeah <laughs> but there's so <laughs> there was so much to unpack when it comes to kind of well-being because it's looked different for each of us in the different stages we've been at with jobs for you Ikem, and in mm. Rebecca's job as well but as a parent for you Rebecca and just in the way that it's imp- impacted our university experiences Jamie Hannah and I mm. um it has really I think it's had to shape uh, each of us as a person. I feel like I've come back from university and I um, have become significantly more uh, talkative, or at least at university, I learned that this introvert needed to make friends. So I had to (laughs) present as the most extroverted person I could be um, in order to make sure that I had, you know, a good network of friendships and all of that at university because you lose out on it. Um, And that, is a really big massive impact on your university experience I had people say to me you know you know you you know you might meet people in the first few weeks but they might not be your forever friends that's okay it might take you a little bit of time to make your kind of forever uni friends uh but I kind of met a few people I went to university and we're in a local lockdown already and so I met a few people and I was like well you're stuck with me now like that was the way that we had to go (laughs) because that was just the way that it's so impacted just relationships and people's well-being generally and things like that so it hasn't yeah it's been a really interesting one for for well-being um in every context I think um so yeah we've kind of mentioned at different points that there are also been other people that have been disproportionately impacted by it I know that Ikem you've touched on that would you like to expand on that a little bit more um feel free not to um I think Largely, in, in my role, I, could, I would have to start looking at it from like a professional point of view. Um, I, I can't speak for any specific local authorities, but I think largely what we've seen and what I've seen personally over the last kind of two years is this like steady increase in applications for young people to get plans that are going to support them related to special educational needs and or disabilities. And uh, a big spike in applications pertaining to social, emotional, and mental health, where largely a lot of the kids are just dealing with anxiety. It's anxiety, it's fear about how to get into school. They don't wanna leave the home. And there's no like immediate report or any like, you can't link causality and go, oh, well, kids aren't going to school because we've had a lockdown. But in that space and time, we've been able to see that a lot of children are struggling with the idea of accessing school the way it's been set up and particularly moving out of the uh, face-to-face kind of setup. And I don't know whether it's just the lockdown or also just the fact that as we've changed and been met with that challenge of lockdown, the part of well-being that's been sort of magnified is, I think, what we could call educational psychology, how, you know, how a young person kind of gets ready and is in themselves okay to access school and it's variable things you know and there's so much that underpins learning 
for someone, there's so much that makes learning work for one person, I think. And that's kind of highlighted that and made us more sensitive to that. I can't say anything about whether more of these plans are, are coming out, but there's definitely been more applications. And so I think, you know, whilst we've all been disconnected, it's it also made me realize that there's levels of challenge for different groups of people. Um, what is it like to be a parent at home in lockdown with a child with special needs? You know, that's a challenge that's not going away. It's very different to not being able to just go and see your friends. That's also important. But what is that like? And, you know, the, what's it like to be there trying to encourage a child to do some work or they can't get through to it or they can't feel all right enough to even access school in that way and you're, you're kind of helpless you know so there was a lot of parents also from a parental point of view um brought on a lot of anxiety particularly for parents with children with special educational needs and i know there are some people in in the church as well who fall into that context and even having discussions with them you know that was another group of people who i think were affected like we all were and it just made me realize that if anything, even if I didn't have the answer, you know, it was so important to just reach out and have a conversation. Once again, I kind of come back to this the idea of this podcast. It's good because then we just kind of get to mill through things and search through all these things that we've been through that we probably haven't had the chance to talk about. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we, you know, we've all seen, we've been discussing just how much of an impact like uh, COVID had on everybody's well-being. Um, people that I think you wouldn't even anticipate in, in an education context have been impacted, like I have just mentioned. Um, and we've seen a lot kind of over the pandemic of social issues being brought to the forefront um, and that kind of impacting a lot of people's well-being or, or affecting and shaping that. So how has that in an educational context um, as well impacted just your own thoughts surrounding education and perhaps your own experiences, if you've reflected on that, um, with being in education as well. This is for me, right? Who of you? Oh, okay. Um, well, uh, I think I'll start. For me, real quick, I think it's just made me, um, personally as a teacher, uh, and probably somebody who helps parents from a more behind-the-scenes kind of position, think about how I approach people. Um, it's the practice of it and just to be a bit more human I think is important it's so important to check in with people um and find out where they're at and because I think when when it was teaching it made me look at how am I doing this teaching you know am I you've got to find a different way to connect with the student you haven't seen them for registration in the morning you haven't seen them about the halls to have a chat so, you know, you've got to really find the time to um, take each person into account, be personable, care. And that was one thing that it kind of switched up for me in the teaching practice before I stepped out of it. Yeah, I think uh, for me, one thing I, I, uh, yeah, I was reflecting on as well, um, especially when we're talking about social impacts and um, there was a lot of different things that was going on, I think, in society um, when the pandemic hit I remember in in second year for for me um in Portsmouth there were a lot of um different campaigns that were going on and one of those being Black Lives Matter and um I just think uh what was was amazing just reflecting in myself a lot of my my friends they were just so interested in supporting this thing even though it was lockdown I think there was lockdown restrictions and that kind of thing or it just kind of was a new thing um but but these guys were um seeing the importance of that despite it being quite a a crazy period it was an interesting period where we saw a lot of people kind of unite together and I think explore Mm -hmm. um many different things um and many issues were were raised and and many things that maybe were on the surface were were brought to light and um yeah it was really interesting also for me because I was thinking about um, when I was younger in my primary and my secondary school I was probably the only um, ethnically diverse child in my friendship group 
And then I'm now looking at uni when actually there's so many, I've got loads of old friends from all types of backgrounds, all different nations, and it's incredible. Um, and so I was actually reflecting. I think healthfully that was one of the things that um, for me and, and for my friends, that was one thing that, that was brought to surface Black Lives Matter that kind of united us through a moment when you're thinking about the pandemic, you wouldn't think that's going to unite or, or there's going to be something that's going to bring people together. But um, I definitely saw that be a thing that helped and, and kind of grew us together as, as friends. And I'm believing that helped a lot of other people as well around. Um, and, and yes, yeah, so that was just one thing I was thinking about as well. I think it also put us in a position where we had to be a lot more intentional and almost it was it felt a lot more difficult to be vulnerable I think was how I felt because it it almost felt a bit unnatural to bring things up it wasn't like oh I see you every day you're like how are you I'm like do you know what actually today's been a bit rough because of this it almost like kind of hit the point where because we weren't seeing each other regularly to send a message and be like look I'm not gonna lie I'm not feeling great today it felt weird um and I remember and like you think you just want to be like having a nice deep conversation like on your sofa at home and I remember when um when everything happened with Sarah Everard I remember taking a walk um with a friend and I remember being sat on a bench in the middle of Epping and just crying and I was like this is such a weird because when else are you going to like be like, you know what, let's go outside and have this chat about how we're feeling. Like it was such an unnatural, just an unnatural situation to be in. And it just felt like, oh my gosh, okay, I now have to be a lot more intentional because if I'm feeling like this, like how are my friends feeling? So it felt like everything had to become a lot more intentional where you weren't seeing people regularly. Things didn't come up organically um yeah it had to take it took a lot more reaching out rather than taking the easy way out sometimes for sure I actually want to pick up on that as well because that reminded me Hannah of um a time when I was uh I think it was sort of 2019 or 2020 over the the first pandemic hit and I was back home and I remember actually just me being intentional about using this time and seeing this time like I'm here with my family a time when you know I might be 20 years down the line somewhere else I might not be here with my family a time where my brother's just literally sleeping the other side of the room like there might not be time like that so I was intentional with the time I had for my family and actually also mm-hmm. I knew a lot of neighbors as well that didn't know Jesus and I used this time um, as a time to evangelize I remember using that being me going on walks or me literally sharing podcasts and stuff like that and that was something I felt like God was challenging me to do I know um for instance my dad he went on the street and was going out and preaching and and that kind of thing and so I know for me it was it was a moment I felt like God said hey here's some time that you can really use to to really press into me um so I felt like on a on a spiritual front this this pandemic definitely helped me um kind of go through those kind of things and and from that I thought amazing conversations came through and um like Hannah said as well I think there were there were moments where I was able to go really deep and have deep conversations with people that needed to be had as well um so yeah I thought it was just such an, an amazing period as a as a whole um but of course it was it was one that that's not the same for everyone that wasn't everyone's story um but yeah I, that just really reminded me of that Hannah just on the back of what, oh, go ahead. No, go on. Go on. Apologies. <laughs> go no, on, just to say, touching on the social, like, you know, we've talked about a lot of the social issues. And I think for me, it makes me reflect in education as we're moving forward. We're supposed to have come so far in the 21st century. We're supposed to be so enlightened and tolerant. But what came out in the last 18 months is how there is still so much division and so many issues that women still feel unsafe to walk home um Mm. that racism is uh, I've never had to deal with it as much as in the last three years at school and I've been teaching a very long time you know and it makes me think what do we need to change the way that we're educating then because we do token gesture anti-racism and token gesture 
how to feel safe and empowering girls but actually it's got to be ingrained in our education system so um mm. I know uh, just big shout out to Thomas Willingale because actually they're very good and um, the CPR training recently but um Feliso came home talking about the Windrush and I had I'm going to be honest I didn't know anything about the Windrush generation growing up no one ever educated me I think many of us did that it's come out like I don't know it's just not nothing was ever taught and all I did was traditional school which is still there the curriculum of history is very much European history and actually look at our society so like my kids say are we going to learn about African history and things like that because actually if you think a lot of our generation now they're their ancestors have come from India. They have made England and the United Kingdom what it is today. But we don't learn that history. And it's only until, uh, like, I was looking at the life in the UK test that I learned half of this stuff. So actually, I think we can't just be teaching this linear, and here is a Motton Bailey castle, and then the First World War, Second World War. We have to be much more open from an early age. I think to discussing all these social issues in the curriculum if we're going to break it down because I think otherwise in a hundred years we're still going to be here in the same boat mm. these issues are still going to be coming out in crisis yeah yeah I think that's a really really fair point um for me I think it, it begs the question much like yourself Rebecca so what what needs to change in education and I think Particularly for me, like how it relates to well-being is like each person is going to kind of understand themselves as part of their society um, and, and how they fit into their society. And I think one thing that came up between everything that happened, Sarah Everard, uh, BLM, so many other things, you know, the, the world was carrying on. It now became like, OK, what does education have to say about this? And I think maybe education does need to not just kind of reinvent itself in a historical kind of context, but also how we keep up current events and talk about these things, because I think you're, you're hundred percent right, Rebecca, we, we kind of signpost things and we've got a month for something and we might have a day that probably gets no recognition in a PSHE curriculum. And so we don't ever broach these topics. We don't ever have these conversations. We don't ever kind of fill in the gaps. Um, so whilst there are things in, a, in, in every respect to history, not just history, what happened and who won the wars and how civilizations came to be and things like that, um, that's important in education. Because I think it, it also, I found that that created a big barrier for people during the lockdown as well. You know, they were, they were dealing with these issues. They were dealing with what it means to be a woman, what it means to feel safe in society what it means to feel safe as a person of color in society and all these things. And then not seeing that reflected could actually have a variable effect on how children engage and access the school system itself. So it's got to be reflective of what's gonna help our kids survive and also make meaning in the world and feel safe. And I, although I don't wanna admit it, Pythagoras theorem doesn't necessarily help people do that I shouldn't say that as a math teacher but that's the reality you know there's more to it yeah um there are definitely I think it's posed a lot of questions and I've had so many people talking about just generally you know what what do we teach in schools how can we get this to change how can we be more um inclusive of um other things and actually teach kind of different perspectives on different historical events will be interesting as well a lot of the time you learn the British perspective and you know like the Brits are always shown to be in the best light but that isn't necessarily the actual fact of the the matter um if you look at the different perspectives and the different things um and I think yeah hopefully more recent events and with the pandemic will actually impact the way that education is run at its core in terms of just more of a focus on well-being and making sure that people are okay um, less of a focus, sorry, again, on Pythagoras theorem and more on um, other more practical things um, for people to to learn about and just be really educated uh, on. Uh, so just kind of 
summarising, looking forward at all of this. Um, obviously, we're talking as as all Christians um, and people who have been in education or are in education. Um, and so I want to pose a question to everybody. Uh, what should our response as a church be in order to support people in education? Um, so you can answer that a bit more specifically geared to you, uh, whether it's jobs, parents, being in education, how could people better better support you in that? Um, I think from a Christian perspective, it could probably, uh, I'd have to put it out to every aspect. So that's like professionally, family-wise. I think it's um, about having compassion and remembering that there's compassion out there for you. So, you know, work-wise, you've got to show up, how to deal with people um, with a lot more compassion, to, to be very honest with you. I think that's a buzzword um, because oftentimes you can't get to, couldn't get to the root of things immediately from work or whether I'm teaching or at school or there was nothing I could change also at home. Um, but I could be there and I could listen and take more time to hear someone's point of view, to really understand their perspective. Um, and that gave them, that creates safety in, in any space you're in. Um, so that's one thing for me, I think, is, all, is, is the way to show up in this crisis and continue showing up. Um, and particularly from a school point of view, I think we've got to be led that way we've got to be taking the time to chat to everybody at every level you know colleagues with colleagues students with their peers and teachers with families or families you know stay connected and stay talking and um kind of opening up those support networks through just showing up yeah i think for um young adults and and students what i think um is something I've particularly been experiencing in this season um, is kind of understand where well, as a young adult and as students they're making life transforming decisions like the decision you make at the age of 20 that's going to affect you at the age of 30 mm. and 40 and I think that's even more important especially after lockdown thinking about what are students running to for comfort where are they going when times are hot and so I think particularly in the church, um, as, as a group, as a member of people, I think it's important um, to look out for the young people and for students. I think particularly, um, potentially people that are older than the students, older adults, looking out for these students and, and understanding you've also been in that situation. You've been in those moments where you've made life choices and you've seen how they've gone and spreading wisdom to those students and engaging with them. And I think really, um, I think really students connecting with especially elders or, or families in the in the church, I think is a big one, because I think the amount of wisdom that you as a student can get from these people that have gone through life um, is so life transforming. So I think that would be one thing I was I was really thinking about um, and just really for the people who are at church. And if you know students or if you're in contact with these young people keep asking them how is their week going and keep on praying for them as well in their in the education system because you just don't know what a difference it can make having someone praying for you and and the difference that young person can be in that education system as well the different people they can influence and impact and as I said that these are young people that their lives is so it's so amazing just the life transformation that can happen and just the different people that are affected so that would be um yeah just one point I was thinking about I was going to say the exact same thing as Jamie I think like reach out I think particularly being uh in youth going through high school being in school it's really uh being in church so it's really easy to be seen as the kids of so and so rather than your own person and that can be really difficult when it comes to making decisions because as much as my friends are amazing and they can give great advice and they can give godly advice, they can only advise up to a point because we're all at the same stage in life. They've not experienced all of this before. So yeah, I'd say my biggest thing is like reach out because the idea of like, yeah, 
as a 15 year old like choosing my GCSEs which then impact my A-levels which impacts my degree like it's such an overwhelming feeling mm. and the idea of being like like it's so easy I thought my parents all the time is do you know who'd be a good person to talk to about this so and so but the idea of like but yeah like a 15 year old me would just be like there's no way I'm just gonna go up to someone at church and be like hey this is difficult at school <laughs> I know that you can do this like so I think yeah I'd say like reach reach out would be my main my main thing because I also yeah. I also wanted to add on as well I wanted to reverse it as well for for students or young adults I also think um if you're in um in those moments where it is a Sunday and you're looking out for families I think especially um if there is a mother or a dad on their own ask them how their week's gone have a conversation with them and also think how in a week maybe can you support them because I think a big thing I've I've learned as well is over COVID the pandemic for a lot of parents it's been so hard like honestly they've had children for so long in their house energetic running around and so <laughs> think about how can you help them out in the in the week as well and and that's just something uh I'm actively trying to do a lot more in my life so that would also be in my encouragement think about how in a week can you maybe support them can you be that babysitter mm. and also like don't be scared about it because there are so many people I feel that actually just really want to get to know the younger people but don't really like not necessarily don't know how to but I feel like it's always an awkward thing to start like you know just being like hey how are you like it's an awkward conversation to have for the first time and yeah so to just not be scared to initiate I actually sent a very embarrassing message to someone um and it actually makes me cringe because I sent a message to someone being like hey Emma and I would really like to see you we think you're really cool and the second I sent it Emma was cracking up and I was like why was that what I chose to say but actually like people really want to get to know you so it doesn't matter how embarrassing the message is just go for it because you're not going to get a bad response. No one's going to turn around and go, no, you're all right, thanks. Don't really want to talk to you. Mm. So. Yeah, and I think like I would echo that as a parent. Like I always say this, what's the worst that can happen? Someone says no. Okay, move on. But I think like really just echoing. So for me as a parent, just keep on asking people like I know I come across as this super competent super all well maybe I don't actually maybe I don't look like I've got it all together but <laughs> people tell me I am machine by name and machine by nature and but actually there are days where you don't see the real Rebecca um when I'm by myself or with them with my closest friends and actually you know I have no time I am full-time in a busy job and then running two very sporty boys five times a week to football there's very little time at the end of it um for me so the people who I've really appreciated in this last season have been people who've just walked alongside me in life so I will name people Monica um today endured the whole of Spider-Man from Isaac recounting it I give away no spoilers but it's very good but um we walked and you know she just gets involved in our life um two of my school friends we do curry night together they play chess with Felito they'll talk to Isaac and it's people who walk alongside with mm. you in where mm. you're at and actually you know what being with families is not as stressful as it might seem and um, there's a lot of fun that can be had that maybe if you're younger you wouldn't experience that Emma you've got articulate on Christmas day I'm sure you had a lovely time but it, you know it's different and I think what you're all saying and what my experiences have been Sometimes when we're not in a good place, to ask for help is a really vulnerable thing to do. Oh, we just don't have capacity. But actually, if someone asks me, I'm always going to say yes. Um, and so yeah. one thing I'm having to learn, Monica challenged me, is you ask people. And that's often like Hannah was saying, it feels awkward. Can we come like, can we come and watch the football at your house, please? Um, it's awkward. But actually, I did that with people recently and it was so great. So I think we've all got to just lose the British reserve, be more northern, <laughs> go walk into the house yes. without blocking. That's what happens up north. And um, I think, you know, 
that it like the worst thing is someone says no okay that's fine but if we don't we just lose that community and as Christians we should be modeling different to the rest of the world we are family um, and families have good and bad days let's yeah. work together I think right I'm moving to like up up north to Bolton for the next lockdown then that's what I think I'll yeah, do. do you know what it's funny we I've got a friend <laughs> who I haven't seen in years but when we were growing up together he literally just walks into our house the whole time I'm like right yourself <laughs> um, my best friend she comes around she's straight in the kitchen making the tea and coffee it's um probably not as much as when I was growing up but with those you know you just walk in and you know what mm. it's nice it, it's really nice in fact um the pierces I always say sometimes I'm just going to walk into your house because Malcolm's always in the back tinkering in the shed <laughs> so I say I'm just going to walk in and that's how it should be that I know yeah. they wouldn't worry if I was to walk into their house um yeah. with the doors unlocked you know what we're all family we're all friends together um yeah. I think it's important that we we know we can trust those people we trust I think it's really important to remember that a sense of community requires a bit of vulnerability on both sides as well and an effort, you know. Um, you've got to reach out for the other person and I think it's so funny we're all saying the same thing but it's so true and so key to remember that you've also got to reach out and th it doesn't always have to be something wrong. Sometimes it's just calling to connect. It's like, hey, I just thought about you. Hey, can we come and watch the football at your house? It's being together for together's sake. And that's one thing that we realized when we couldn't be together. It's like, oh man, like that, that really counts. <laughs> you know, that really makes a difference just the being together and being able to show up for one another. So I'm, I make you all right on that. And I'm, I'm thinking about little ways in which I could do that more. And, and sometimes it's taking the time with the people inside your house as well. Um, like someone said, I think Jamie said that. That's a, been a really big thing, just taking time to spend time with my siblings intentionally, on purpose. That's, that's, that's something special. So, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I want to just say a massive thank you to each of you for coming on um, and sharing all of your wonderful wisdom and just being part of this conversation, making um, time and space for it, because I know, um, well, in terms of, for anybody <laughs> listening slash watching <laughs> it's been a long road to try and organize when we can all get together because people are so yeah. busy um so i just want to thank you all so much for making the space and the time um to be here and to be able to have the conversation um and be open and honest and real um and i want to thank anybody who's listening and joining with us um and yeah encourage you to think about how you can be reaching out to people in education uh, championing perhaps students um, within your church or families um, or anything um, or anybody in education uh, I'm sure generally that kind of anybody loves when you reach out to them but in an educational context <laughs> that's what we've highlighted today is just something that people most. really people long for um, and and just mm. want the community so yeah thank you all so much for being part thank you everybody for listening um, goodbye and God bless.